Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Whitney Felder. I'm the Communications Specialist for Fed Communities. Welcome to Connecting Communities, a Community Approach to Disaster Recovery. If you are a returning, if you are a returning Connecting Communities participant, welcome back. If this is your first Connecting Communities webinar, you are in for a treat. Before we move to the content for today's event, I would like to share a few housekeeping items. Today's session is being recorded and will later be available for viewing. Views expressed during this session are those of the speakers and are intended for informational purposes only. They do not necessarily represent the views of Fed communities or the views of the Federal Reserve System. Microphones have been muted. Please use the Q&A feature throughout the session to submit questions. We promise to get to as many of them as possible during our Q&A portion of this presentation. Also, throughout today's event, you will see periodic polling questions. We encourage you to answer the polls. They provide helpful insight as we move through today's discussion. Finally, feel free to keep the conversation going and engage with us on Twitter using the hashtag connecting communities and visit fedcommunities.org for a variety of CD articles, resources, and data across the Federal Reserve System. Now, I will turn it over to Nishesh Shalise, Manager of the Institute for Economic Equity at the St. Louis Fed. Thank you, Nishesh. Thank you, Whitney, and uh, thank you to the entire Fed Communities team and the Center for Learning and Innovation for getting this uh, event together. We, we truly appreciate all the work you put into this event. Uh, and thank you everyone who has joined here to discuss and uh, learn about this very uh, important topic. My name is uh, Nishesh Chalise, and I'm manager of the Institute for Economic Equity at the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, St. Louis. Um, so natural disasters. On the next slide, um, you can see that natural disasters have tremendous, um, tremendous impact. Just for example, between the five-year period of 2018 and 2022, there have been 90 natural disasters that have cost a billion dollars or more and the total costs being six, more than $600 billion and have caused more than 1,700 deaths. And these are only the big billion dollar natural disasters. And we know there are many others that happen and have a significant implications for the community we live in and work in. It truly affects all of us. Um, as a shared report in a recent report based, based on the survey of household uh, decision-making in the um, next slide, uh, we show that um, in 2022, 13% of adults in um, US were affected by natural uh, disasters. Many of you in the audience have perhaps been impacted or know someone who has been impacted. Two of the most common ways people were affected is by damage to their property. So think about how flooding or tornadoes, hurricanes can impact our homes or by disrupting, disrupting in income. If you're dealing with the damage, don't have a place to stay, it can be difficult to continue to going to your work or running your small business. This report also finds that people with lower income were more likely to be affected by natural disasters. For example, 19% of adults with family income below $25,000 reported any disaster-related hardship, compared with only 9% of adults with family income of $100,000 or more. There were similar differences by race and ethnicity as well, where Black or Hispanic adults were more likely to be affected compared to white or Asian adults. In the other slide, we look at a different aspect of um, disasters, that is uh, being displaced from your homes and the ability to return to your home. We also see some disparities by income here. This particular data, this particular graph is based on the census's household uh, pulse survey. You can see that lower income families experience the highest race, rates of displacement from natural disasters. In the following slide, it shows that uh, lower income families have um, are less likely to return to their homes. So whether you look at um, speedy return to home, so less than less than a week, uh, who is uh, returning home, you see that lower income um, households uh, have a lesser um, likelihood. 
But when you go on the other side and look at never returned home, uh, lower income households have uh, a higher representation on that side. Although natural disasters disrupt many lives, the impact and recovery from the uh, from the impact can look different. So um, on the next slide, uh, we highlight this idea of unequal impact on un unequal uh, recovery from natural disasters. There has been accumulating research that shows um, that whether it is uh, financially constrained homeowners after Hurricane Harvey or loss of uh, wealth among black residents of a county impacted by disasters, more and more um, studies show that the impact is unequal and the recovery is also unequal. One of the first steps in address addressing these challenges is understanding how disaster assistant assistance works and what role we all can play. Today, I am grateful to my FEMA colleagues for joining us to talk about the various resources that are available and their work in disaster assistance. The goal is to provide you, our audience members, who may directly or indirectly play a role in disaster assistance to the communities you serve, especially the low and moderate income communities. We will first begin with Dan Schulman, who is the Senior External Affairs Specialist from FEMA Region 5. Dan will provide an overview of disasters and disaster uh, assistance. We'll then move to James Sink, who is the Regional Flood Insurance Liaison for FEMA Region 5, who will introduce flood insurance through the National Flood Insurance Program. And finally, Mike Pickerel, who is the Volunteer Agency Liaison for Region 7, and Mike will provide us uh, an overview of community organizations active in disasters or coads. I'll be passing the mic soon, but as you listen to these uh, presentations, please be thinking about what role you or your organization can play or have been playing in your communities when it comes to disaster assistance. Once the presenters have finished their presentations, we will get to the Q&A part of the webinar. So please send in your questions, either to a specific presenter or to the whole group, and we'll keep this dialogue going. Without further delay, Dan, the floor is all yours. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to the St. Louis Federal Reserve and the Federal Communities team for inviting FEMA to join you today to talk about a community approach to recovery. I'm gonna begin our conversation by providing a brief overview of how FEMA gets involved in disasters and the basics of disaster assistance. My colleagues and I'll talk today about the different pieces of that effort, from disaster financial assistance, flood insurance, and the community partners who drive recovery. Given our limit, limited time today, this is going to be just a snapshot of all that's involved. So please feel free to visit our website via the links in today's presentation for more details. But more importantly, after today's session, we hope that you'll find a way to get involved in your community to join us in this important work. We can move on to our slides, please. FEMA's mission is helping people before, during, and after disasters. In executing this mission, we're driven by our core values of compassion, integrity, fairness, and respect. Next slide, please. FEMA is just one part of a consolidated and coordinated effort to assist communities recovering from disasters. FEMA does not and cannot accomplish this work alone. We work as a part of a team. While we may get an outsized share of attention, emergency management and community recovery is most successful when it's locally executed, state managed, and federally supported. When we respond to disasters, we're working in places we're familiar with and with state partners that we know, but it's local community representatives who best understand the unique needs, opportunities, and risks that we're working with. This knowledge must be leveraged to achieve success. Next slide, please. First, a quick reminder of how FEMA gets involved in disasters. As a reminder, only the governor of a state, chief executive of a federally recognized tribal nation or territory such as Guam or Puerto Rico can request a federal disaster declaration under FEMA's authorities. Only incidents that exceed the capacity of a state or tribal nation's ability to effectively respond and recover are eligible for federal assistance from FEMA. But it's important to note that not every incident rises to this level. And in fact, most do not. This slide, you show, this slide shows you the typical progression of the process for a request, from incident to damage assessment to request to analysis provided to the president 
who makes the final determination about what type of disaster assistance to make and what types of assistance will be available. Next slide, please. Following the declaration of a disaster under the Stafford Act, FEMA's implementing authorities, FEMA may be authorized to provide two principal programs, individual assistance, which is grants to individuals and households, or public assistance, which is grants to states, tribal and local governments, and eligible nonprofit organizations. This slide provides a brief overview of each of these programs. Once declared, FEMA works with our state, local, and voluntary partners to promote the availability of disaster assistance every way we can, from traditional and social media releases, email distribution of notices to partner organizations, and town hall style meetings like this one. We also utilize disaster survivor assistance teams, or DSAT, who will go door to door canvassing in neighborhoods, especially in the first days of the declaration. This innovation allows FEMA to target the hardest hit areas, typically directed by local officials or geospatial information system data, GIS, to hand out disaster registration information, answer questions, and even conduct on the spot registration using mobile devices. Otherwise, disaster survivors can register by calling our toll free number, visiting our website, downloading the FEMA app to their smart device, or once established, visiting a fixed location disaster recovery center, or if necessary, a mobile disaster recovery center, which we typically use in disasters impacting larger geographic areas or disasters affecting more rural areas. It's important to understand that FEMA was designed to provide emergency assistance to individuals. Our disaster assistance grants are not intended to replace insurance and are not intended to make people whole. While the maximum grant for this fiscal year is $41,000, the average grant for most people is far less than that. Nationally, it averages between five and $7,000. In the recent disasters that impacted the St. Louis region, the average grant was at the lower end of that scale, just over $5,000 for the two for the two disasters combined. FEMA disaster assistance is not a structured entitlement. Rather, it's eligibility based. Once a survivor registers, in many cases, FEMA will send an inspector to assess damages, and based on that inspection, a determination will be made about how much assistance a survivor may receive. This determination can be appealed. On the public assistance side, FEMA can reimburse for eligible work, debris removal, and a range of permanent repair work to public and nonprofit infrastructure, including schools, hospitals, and utilities. We can also aid eligible houses of worship for disaster damages and the work they do during disasters. Finally, the president may also authorize the U.S. Small Business Administration to offer low interest disaster recovery loans to individuals, organizations, and businesses. These loans, which can supplement FEMA grants and pay for items not covered by FEMA, are a critical piece of recovery for many individuals. A further piece of the recovery puzzle is insurance, both flood, which my colleague James is going to talk about, and homeowners. But we find that too many individuals are uninsured or underinsured. So a quick plug, check with your agent about your risks and double check your coverage and make sure your loved ones do the same. For those with continued unmet needs after FEMA, SBA, and insurance, we'll work with our partners at the federal, state, local, and voluntary agency level to help fill the remaining gaps. Next slide, please. I mentioned at the outset that FEMA doesn't work alone. We're part of a team in response and recovery. FEMA provides a range of disaster assistance. SBA helps fill gaps with their loans. Insurance goes on the next level to make people whole, but other partners are also active in many disasters providing assistance to communities and individuals with long-term recovery. Some quick examples. The Housing and Urban Development provides community development block grants that can be used to help re recovery and, and provide the cost share for FEMA programs. The Natural Resource Conservation Service pays for stream and river cleanup not eligible for FEMA public assistance. USDA insurance programs provide re uh, reimbursement for farm buildings and equipment or crops and livestock that aren't eligible for FEMA. The private sector partners who quickly move in with temporary solutions to restore cellular service, reopen stores, and restore commodity distribution help support survivors and get local economies restarted. FEMA utilizes local hiring and contracting, both to bolster our disaster workforce and redirect recovery dollars right back into the community 
where the assistance is needed most. And these are just a few examples of the key partnerships we rely on after disasters. So who needs our help most and how can you help? The simple truth is that for most people, the, for people with networks and resources, a declared disaster will be challenging, frustrating, and heartbreaking. But they'll be able to reach out to friends and relatives, use savings, take advantage of insurance, and figure out the myriad of programs, and they'll recover. But for those on the margins, those who were struggling before the event, the people who worked two jobs, or who were unbanked, or underinsured, or uninsured, people without legal status, or with limited English proficiency, or with a disability, a disruptive event can destroy a carefully crafted network of support. Before, during, and after declared disasters, the full weight of the federal government can be brought to bear to respond. And yet still, there will be those for whom government programs will be insufficient. We rely on a network of voluntary partners to serve disaster survivors. Today, we're calling upon those of you that are not currently involved to get involved with those partners that we've talked about today or will talk about to help us going forward. I'm now gonna turn it over to my friend, James Sink, who's going to talk about the role of the National Flood Insurance Program. And I'll look forward to your questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Dan. Um, I always uh, learn something new. I hope uh, many of you have learned uh, something uh, new as well as Dan was calling out, thinking about how we play a role. I just wanna uh, mention a response from uh, the polls. Almost half of the who have joined uh, are nonprofit organizations. So you are probably already either working or are poised very well to work with your communities. I do wanna point out that uh, there's also representation from financial institutions and government. So I think this uh, fits very well with uh, forming partnerships to uh, think about uh, recovery for our uh, communities. Um, okay, passing it on to uh, James. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Nisha, Shandan. My name is James Sink. I am the Regional Flood Insurance Liaison for FEMA Region 5. Uh, so that means that I, I basically uh, work with uh, policyholders, local elected officials, nonprofits, um, pretty much anyone in, in the states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan uh, on issues related to flood insurance. Um, I have a colleague in Region 7, so that would be Missouri, um, who's responsible for, for states in, in the middle part of the country. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So let's go ahead and, and talk uh, quickly about the difference between flood insurance and disaster assistance. Dan spoke to us about disaster assistance and he said, um, very importantly, that, that disaster assistance is not a substitute for insurance. Disaster assistance through FEMA um, is not intended to return the home to its pre-disaster condition. Um, insurance uh, and especially flood insurance on the other hand are designed uh, to in some cases uh, build back better um, but hopefully at least return the home to its pre-disaster condition. Let's go to the next slide. Um, before we do that though I think we kind of need to understand where we're at today. Um, flooding is the nation's most common and costly natural disaster. Um, very few flood events actually receive a major disaster declaration under the Stafford Act, um, and therefore disaster assistance through FEMA is not available for the vast majority of flood events. And as you can see, uh, in the states in Region 5, flood insurance coverage is incredibly low, and the same is true for the states in Region 7 as well. Um, in Illinois, we have about 33,000 flood, insur 33, flood insurance policies in force across the entire state, um, and those policy counts are decreasing. So as time goes on, um, we know that flooding is the most common and costly natural disaster, but people are increasingly underinsured for flood. It's already the number two event for which people are, are, are underinsured right behind earthquake. And as time goes on, that coverage gap is getting worse. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And we can actually skip this slide, or actually no, let's stay here. Um, so we had mentioned uh, that flood insurance is not a substitute for disaster assistance. And, and this is a, a good visualization of that. Uh, on the slide here, you'll see federal disaster declarations across the six states in my region, uh, for which flooding was one of the reasons for that disaster declaration. Uh, you'll see that tall blue bar. Uh, that's the average flood insurance claim for that event. 
And you can compare that to the green bar, the small short bar, which is the average disaster assistance payment. Again, disaster assistance is not intended to return the home to its pre-disaster condition. It is only intended to make the home safe, sanitary, and functional. Insurance, and particularly flood insurance, on the other hand, are designed to restore the home. And like I said, in some cases, build back better. Um, and you'll see uh, there's even one event where there was no disaster assistance available. That disaster declaration was only for public assistance. There was no help available through FEMA to individual homeowners and renters for that. Uh, it's the third one in, in Wisconsin. There was no disaster assistance available uh, for that flood event. Next slide. So I think that um, you're going to kind of catch a theme here. Disaster assistance is not a substitute for insurance. Again, disaster assistance requires that major disaster declaration under the Stafford Act um, approved by the president. Most flood events do not receive that disaster declaration. Importantly, most disaster assistance is in the form of a loan through the Small Business Administration, which has to be paid back with interest. Uh, Dan gave us the most recent numbers for individual assistance. So this year, the average uh, maximum amount of individual assistance is about $41,000 for home repair and home replacement, and about $41,000 for other needs assistance. And like I mentioned earlier, the most important thing to remember is that disaster assistance is only intended to make the home safe, sanitary, and functional. Uh, vacation homes, investment properties, secondary homes, uh, most commercial businesses, most, uh, most commercial uh, structures are also not eligible for disaster assistance through FEMA. Um, there may be exceptions to that, but as a general rule, they're not going to be eligible through FEMA. They would be looking at the Small Business Administration. So for those types of structures, people are going to want to have flood insurance uh, or uh, another insurance product that covers flooding um, in order to uh, make sure that they're able to recover post-event. Next slide. And this one here um, kind of reiterates the importance of flood insurance. Remember that flood insurance does not depend on a major disaster declaration. If there is a flood and someone has a flood insurance policy, we are going to pay that claim, assuming that the claim is, assume, assuming that they have a valid loss. Uh, there is no payback requirement for verified losses. We do not cancel policies based off of loss history, although loss history is something we consider when it comes to the premium. Uh, the best indica indicator of a past flood loss is a future. Uh, the best indicator of a future flood loss is a past flood loss. Policy limits are significantly higher for flood insurance when compared to disaster assistance. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, disaster, uh, flood insurance is intended to return the structure to the pre-disaster condition and in some cases build back better. And importantly, any homeowner, business owner, or renter in an NFIP participating community can purchase flood insurance. There is not and has never been a requirement for a structure to be in a floodplain or a special flood hazard area or a flood zone to get flood insurance. They simply need to be located in a participating community. Next slide. Uh, and we can go ahead and go to the next one. So we're going to talk now about how people buy flood insurance and exactly what is covered. Um, so like I had mentioned in the previous slide, there is not and has never been a requirement to uh, be in the floodplain or a special flood hazard area in order to buy flood insurance. However, there are some cases when flood insurance is, um, uh, is mandatory under law. Uh, the, and so an example of that would be is if you have a mortgage in a special flood hazard area, again, any zone starting with A as an Alpha or B as in Victor, then flood insurance is required. For any other flood, flood zone, flood insurance is optional. Uh, flood insurance is also required uh, if you live in an, uh, a flood zone that starts with A as an Alpha or B as in Victor, if you have received certain forms of federal disaster assistance, which we'll be talking about uh, on the next couple slides here. Next slide. Um, and again, importantly, uh, this is one of the most common things that I hear, the most common misconceptions out there. Anyone in an NFIP participating community can purchase flood insurance. It does not matter which flood zone you're in. It doesn't matter if you're in the high risk zones on the left, uh, the low risk zones that are kind of those un unshaded islands throughout the community here. It doesn't matter what zone you're in, you can have flood insurance as long as your community participates. Next slide. So flood insurance covers uh, four things. Uh, it covers the building, it covers personal property, it covers things like debris removal, sandbagging, uh, pumps, that kind of stuff, uh, and it covers uh, increased cost of compliance. That's 
building back better. Uh, if your building is substantially damaged by flooding in the floodplain and you are damaged to 50% of the market value of your structure, there is up to an additional $30,000 available through your flood insurance policy to help you rebuild better and mitigate future flood losses. Remember that building coverage and personal property coverage are always purchased separately. They are two separate premiums. They would be two separate items on the declaration page. So people need to make sure that they have both building coverage and personal property coverage. Uh, if, if, the, if they're a homeowner, uh, if they're a renter, uh, clearly they would only have personal property coverage. They don't have an insured interest in that building. Um, next slide, please. I do think that it's important to talk briefly about group flood insurance policies, particularly given the flood event in July last year in Missouri and um, parts of Illinois. Uh, there are um, a, a, nearly a thousand people on both the Missouri and Illinois side of the border who receive something called a group flood insurance policy. Uh, when I mentioned earlier that there are some circumstances where FEMA uh, disaster assistance, people uh, would have to obtain and maintain flood insurance. This is an example of that. So there are some people who were damaged by flooding in July of last year who received disaster assistance from FEMA, who were issued a group flood insurance policy. That group flood, insur group flood insurance policy offers very limited flood insurance coverage for up to three years following the disaster declaration. When that group flood insurance policy expires, uh, the people who received that GFIP do have to go out and purchase their own flood insurance policy. And that requirement applies to the address in perpetuity. So if someone sells their home and they had a GFIP, they need to disclose the obtain and maintain requirement to the new owner. Um, and like I mentioned, this obtain and maintain requirement exists in perpetuity for as long as the address exists. Okay, next slide. And we can also skip this slide. Uh, go ahead and go on. Uh, in general, there's a 30-day waiting period for flood insurance policies to come into effect. So make sure that you buy your flood insurance policy early and renew it every year so that you don't get stuck with that 30-day waiting period. There are three exceptions. The one is if you are making, renewing, increasing, or extending a loan in the special flood hazard area that's secured by um, real property. If that's the case, then we would have to go, or um, yeah, by um, secured by, by property in the special flood hazard area, then there's a, a no waiting period for that flood insurance policy. It becomes effective immediately when that um, loan uh, instrument closes. Uh, there's a one day waiting period if you are newly mapped into the special flood hazard area as the result of a map change. And there's a one day waiting period for certain post wildfire conditions, uh, which I will uh, tell you about if it's an issue, but that is more of an issue out in uh, out west. It's not so much an issue in this part of the country. Next slide. Okay, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, on this slide is a technical definition of flood, but I think what's important is that if someone has flood insurance and they're damaged by something that looks like a flood, they should just file their claim uh, and let their insurance carrier make a decision as to whether or not it's eligible. You're not an insurance adjuster. I'm not an insurance adjuster. If people have flood insurance and they have flood damage, File, let, have them file the claim and work with their carrier. Uh, filing a claim with uh, the National Flood Insurance Program works exactly the same as it does with any other insurance product. You have to notify your carrier, um, work with your adjuster, document your loss. If there is a major disaster declaration under the Stafford Act, people should also register for disaster assistance. There are some things disaster assistance can cover that flood insurance does not. Next slide, please. And we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, the last thing that I'd like to talk about is the Office of the Flood Insurance Advocate. If someone has a problem with their flood insurance uh, of any kind and they cannot resolve it by working uh, with the state uh, NFIP coordinator, by working with me in the regional office or Chris if you're in Region 7, uh, or by working with their carrier, then they can go to the Office of the Flood Insurance Advocate. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a policyholder advocate. If someone has an issue that we can't resolve any other way, uh, that is the place we would send them. Um, but I think that go, uh, does conclude the insurance section. There will be some resource slides following this, but I'll hand it back to Nishesh for our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, 
many of our audience members uh, said that uh, they themselves or their families have been impacted uh, by a natural disaster and um, that the communities they serve have also been uh, impacted by a natural disaster in the past 12 months. Uh, so definitely very relevant information. I didn't know that we could all, uh, anybody could buy um, from the NFIP. So thank you so much. Okay, um, Mike, um, hope you are ready. Um, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you. Uh my name is, uh, as you can see on the screen there, Mike Pickerel. I'm a voluntary agency liaison slash mass care specialist with Region 7. Um, Region 7 takes in Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, and Nebraska. And I am here today to speak on COADS. Uh, next slide, please. Community, um, community organizations active in disaster or co-eds. Uh, this is where you get your hands dirty. Uh, they are made up of NGOs. Keep going. Uh, service organizations, government agencies, faith-based organizations, and concerned citizens. Um, co-eds uh, are under... Well, they're not really under, they are a local organization and they are under the umbrella of VOADS, which is Voluntary Agencies Active in Disaster. It's a state organization and also a national organization. Um, the VOAD stands for Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster. Um, there used, used to be organizations locally that use that term. However, um, businesses and other for-profit uh, organizations didn't like the volunteer. They wanted something else, so they came up with community. Community organizations active in disaster are local organizations, and they are governed locally. All disasters begin and end locally. Uh, I say that because they, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, disaster first responders are local. Uh, if their resources are overwhelmed, uh, they uh, contact the state. And if the state, or, uh, state resources are overwhelmed, then they go ahead and contact us, FEMA, which is a federal emergency management agency, or uh, as we like to call sometimes find every meeting available. So um, I wanted to tell one more thing as far as uh, why these organizations uh, join. Um, probably civic pride, it has something to do with it. Um, government agencies, because it's their responsibility. Um, Faith-based organizations, because they feel a calling to their community to their fellow man to, uh, to respond in disaster. And uh, service organizations and NGOs, because that's what they do. Um, the uh, co-ads uh, are based on the four C's. Um, that's cooperation, communication, coordination, and collaboration. Uh, I think that's four, is that correct? I always leave one out. And the funny thing about that is I leave a different one out every time I talk about it. But anyway, let's talk about some potential members for the co-ads. Next slide, please. You see there um, the local Red Cross, local Salvation Army. Uh, if there's a ministerial alliance uh, or local representatives from uh, churches, the um, volunteers uh, usually come from the churches. If there's a response, I mean, if there is a, a disaster in your community, the churches respond. Um, they may not know what they're supposed to do, but they are out there and they respond. So why not um, get them trained ahead of time? And this is what a co-ed can do. So, um, 
the uh, co-ed can, you can have a, a group of volunteers ready to act uh, right after a disaster and also throughout the uh, response and recovery process. I have local officials on there and I'm kind of um, torn about uh, including local officials, elected officials in your co-ed because sometimes the local elected officials and the co-ed agendas or goals uh, don't meet. So uh, local banks, uh, that is a key because they can help the, um, the co-ed with uh, uh, cash donations. Uh, they can help by uh, setting up uh, checking accounts and helping the co-ed manage their money. Local merchants, uh, lumber yard, home supply, restaurants, etc. This is uh, something that's kind of key with uh, with uh, cash donations that you receive. That money can be spent in the uh, local area, uh, and that can ease the impact of the hit that the uh, local uh, that the disaster had on the on the local economy. So. Um, those are people that you probably want to uh, uh, get in your co-ed and you can tap them for um, information and uh, maybe donations later down the road. I have uh, local service clubs that uh, I like to call the critter clubs, the lions, the eagles, the elks, the moose, whomever, also Kiwanis, JCs, all those people, they have, uh, uh, they have the uh, leaning toward uh, uh, getting involved in their community. And this is another way they can get involved. Um, the local uh, or the uh, county uh, division of family services staff is important. Community action agencies, area aging, I do that every time, area agency on aging. Um, they can help you when you are uh, uh, trying to uh, assist seniors in the area. Centers for Independent Living, or whatever they may be called in your state, uh, another key component because uh, your shelters need to be accessible for those individuals with access and uh, functional needs. Centers for Independent Living can help you uh, find a shelter that is like that or find a building that you can use for a shelter that is accessible. And also they can come up with uh, um, small uh, helpful hints that are inexpensive to help you uh, make the building uh, more accessible for, for those individuals. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanna say that list is not limited to uh, just those uh, groups or individuals, but um, you can uh, go outside of that. Um, again, community organizations active in disaster. They are active in all four uh, phases of emergency management, mitigation, preparedness, uh, response, and recovery. Um, mitigation would be something like um, uh, if you uh, are a hospital, you need a generator uh, in case uh, there's power outages. Um, also, um, you may have seen propane tanks, uh, uh, what they call propane tank farm with all kinds of propane tanks. You wanna make sure those are tied down because you don't want them floating off in a flood and colliding and uh, things like that. Preparedness, um, build a kit, make a plan, stay informed. Uh, you know, that's just the basic individual preparedness. And that's that would be something like that. Um, a response uh, in Missouri, um, the uh, State Emergency Management Agency, along with the uh, state uh, VOAD, uh, they are uh, big proponents of MARCS, M-A-R-C, that's a multi-agency resource center. It's kind of a first stop for um, survivors from disasters. There are all kinds of uh, uh, people there. Red Cross would be there possibly handing out uh, cleanup kits. Salvation Army could be there with uh, hygiene kits. Um, the uh, Department of Insurance could be there to help you um, get through your homeowners or renters insurance. Uh, if you have any questions on that, um, the um, uh, 
licensing bureau can be there if you've lost your license uh, during this during the, the disaster. So um, the the mark is very important, and it is not an end all be all, but that is generally the first step that uh, SEMA and the uh, state or local co-ed will take uh, in response to a disaster. Uh, recovery could be something like uh, repairing a, a torn roof, uh, or um, if there's a, a ramp to your home uh, that has been damaged, that would be something that uh, could be repaired. That would be under recovery. Next slide, please. Uh, what's the function of a co-ed? Um, it ensures that a community is prepared for all hazards, uh, tornadoes, uh, flooding, anything that is like that. Um, and as far as preparedness goes, you want to work with the uh, local emergency manager. Uh, I've always said that a co-ed is an emergency manager's best friend. Uh, generally, uh, you'll see emergency management departments as a department of one or maybe uh, two, if they're lucky. Uh, sometimes it's a half time or a volunteer. So a co-ed can, can really help out and uh, be a force multiplier for the emergency manager uh, in that community. Um, it ensures that uh, you know the public and private agencies uh, they uh, can also uh, assist in uh, responding to the uh, disaster and helping the community recover. And this sentence I stole out of, uh, I don't even know who to give credit to, but anyway, um, the function of a co-ed is to successfully meet the difficult and challenging job of addressing the emergency needs of people affected by disasters. Uh, and that is uh, truly, a uh, difficult and challenging uh, job, um, no matter what the disaster, tornado or flood, um, uh, fire, whatever, it is, uh, it is definitely a challenge. Next slide, please. Just like American Express, I'm going to tell you the benefits of membership at a co-ed. Um, you know, as, as these pop up here, I need to, uh, to put that uh, one and two flip-flop. Uh, various players know one another before meeting in a disaster area. When you're sitting around the uh, table at the COAD meeting, uh, you get to know all the uh, other agencies and organizations that are there, and you get to know what they do. Uh, it is never a good thing to exchange business cards at a disaster site. If you're doing that, then uh, you're definitely in trouble. A friend of mine who's a uh, emergency manager in Mississippi used to say, prom night ain't the night to learn how to dance. And that is so true. Um, so uh, make sure that uh, uh, you meet the people uh, beforehand. Um, also, uh, member agencies know the, the partner's strengths and how quickly those strengths can come to bear during a, a disaster. Uh, there's a reduction of duplication in services. I will talk about this uh, more in other slides as well, but if a co-ed will work with uh, donated resources and there's a finite amount of those donated resources, so you want to make sure that you're not duplicating services, you're not duplicating time, uh, you know, sending two different uh, crews out to a house to repair or to uh, remove uh, debris, whatever, um, because that costs, you want to stretch your resource as far as possible and you don't want to waste time, you don't want to waste money, you don't want to waste volunteers. Also, co-eds, uh, the benefits of membership in a co-ed is a reduction of gaps in services. You don't want people slipping through the cracks. Um, this way, if uh, they uh, register at the mark, you know who they are and uh, 
you can address their needs uh, throughout the process. And also uh, the uh, services are timely. They get there and uh, hopefully they will not, uh, you're not a year out from the disaster, still trying to figure out what houses you're going to and who you're going to help. Next slide, please. This is, uh, this is an important slide because uh, it talks again about uh, the efficiency of the co-ed. Communities with co-eds have a more efficient response. They uh, get into the re recovery phase much earlier and have a more complete recovery with, uh, with co-eds involved. Um, their efficiency and use of resources. Here again, talking about the efficiency and, and uh, not uh, duplicating, uh, duplicating the services that uh, the co-ed provides. Uh, they build uh, collaboration between agencies, volunteers, local emergency management. Um, you can also refer to that as they build community because that's what, that's what you're doing. Um, and the survivors receive uh, uh, aid from a wide variety of agencies that come in. It's, uh, um, you know, for instance, the faith communities, uh, the, uh, the, they all have a national uh, uh, niche or niche, however you want to pronounce that, um, that they perform. Uh, the Baptists have chainsaw crews. They have, uh, they provide meals. Uh, they uh, also uh, do uh, small repairs. The Mennonite Disaster uh, Service does the same thing. They do repairs to homes. Um, the uh, Catholic Charities, they do, they help with long-term recovery. Uh, Adventist Community Services are known uh, for warehousing, that if you can find a warehouse that the Adventist community will come in and provide uh, uh, leadership and uh, management for that warehouse. So there's a wide variety of agencies that will come to your uh, come to your uh, community to help. Now, one thing I will say is, and this is key for all uh, disaster recovery and response, they will not self-deploy. They may call and ask if you need their assistance, but they, you're not going to wake up one morning and see a big trailer out there with them. Uh, they're going to contact you first and ask if you need assistance. Uh, next slide, please. Agencies um, that participate experience less disruption to their operation. Again, more efficient use of resources, less weight, waste and duplication. They have, this is key here, they have a voice in operation. They're sitting at the table and they can, uh, you know, get their input into uh, how the co-ed is responding to the disaster. Uh, and also uh, you're able to manage expectations and a greater access to information, which is uh, key as well. You wanna know what's going on. You wanna know that uh, what you're doing is uh, uh, useful to the overall operation. And next slide, please. Again, uh, you know, this is kind of what I call uh, we're stronger together than we are alone. Um, you're part of a network of agencies. I mentioned uh, some of the faith groups that uh, have a, a national uh, or a niche in uh, disaster uh, response and recovery. Uh, you're going to get all kinds of people coming in to help. And uh, it, uh, it really uh, is... Uh, kind of heartwarming to see these people show up and they're strangers to you, but they're there to, to help. And uh, the co-eds uh, will uh, help guide those folks and, uh, and show them uh, where and how they can help. Next slide, please. Now you're gonna think I am repeating, which I am, but I just wanted you to remember that uh, communities that have co-ads um, have a more efficient response, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
you can look through that and hopefully it'll jog your memory of two slides ago. Anyway, I want you also to remember that uh, if you're sitting out there and you're a concerned citizen or you're a member of a group or a faith community that would like to get involved, uh, please consider joining a, a co-ed or forming a co-ed. If there's not a co-ed in your community, contact your emergency manager and, and uh, tell them that you would like to, uh, to start a co-ed if there's not one in your uh, community. This, uh, this is where you get your hands dirty. This is where you uh, can see that you make a difference. And I think that if you do this, you uh, one of the benefits to you is that uh, you'll feel uh, you'll feel better about yourself that you're giving back to your community. With that, I will turn it back over to Nishish. Thank you, Mike. Um, James, Dan, I would uh, love for you to come on camera and um, we continue this uh, with uh, some some questions. I have a few questions of my own. I see some questions uh, popping up on the on the chat. Um, I guess what I'll start with is um, um, I started my presentation with uh, showing uh, how lower income uh, families, individuals are impacted more and also from the recovery side, um, seems like a slow recovery, more challenge, difficult recovery. Um, so I guess the question is knowing the impact on socially vulnerable households and communities from disasters, how does FEMA use an equity approach to disaster recovery? And Dan, maybe if I can um, start with you and James, Mike, jump in um, if you want to uh, with your own points. Sure, thanks. And I appreciate the question. I think that it is certainly something that this administration has really been honing in on and looking for more ways to, to find a solution there. Uh, I think it, you're asking the right question and it's something that we've been asking ourselves. And finding new and different and better ways to deliver the assistance that is needed to the people that need it most. And I talked, I touched about it a little bit um, in how we're engaging with survivors. So number one is finding the people that need assistance the most. So there's a number of different ways that we're doing this. Uh, one is uh, asking the people that know best. So letting locals drive the response and recovery. We talked about uh, the that disasters begin and end locally. So leaning on our local partners to tell us where is the most damage. That starts in the damage assessment. Damage assessment being driven by local officials. Um, when the disaster is declared, working with our local emergency management partners to tell us where are the heavily damaged areas? Where are the communities that need extra assistance? I talked about disaster recovery centers, citing those disaster recovery centers in the areas where people are, where people with, for individuals with transportation challenges, using technology, geospatial information system, using flooding overlays, where are the most heavily damaged areas, and sending our disaster survivor assistance teams first into those areas to make sure that we're getting those people uh, registered as quickly as we can. There's some things that we can do on on the programmatic side, lessons that we're learning from older disasters. In Puerto Rico, we saw that our programs were miss, um, we weren't recognizing non-traditional ways that homes were transferred in within families. So we, in under this administration, we've expanded the way that we, uh, documentation that we can use to acknowledge home ownership and home responsibility. So. I mean, there are a lot of different ways. And if we had all day, I could talk to you for hours about the different ways that we are expanding our approach. But that's just a few examples. Um, and then the last piece, I want to say something, two quick examples that we used uh, significantly in our two disasters in Missouri and St. Louis, um, which are proactive outreach to individuals who were received a negative determination uh, in their individual assistance claims. So reaching back out to be not waiting for them to call us an appeal, but calling them and saying, hey, we see that you received a negative determination. What's going on? You know, is there something that we can do more? 
And through that effort in Missouri and in Illinois, we were able to deliver millions of dollars in additional assistance because it was simple things like finding out that people, oh, I didn't know that there was an additional document that I needed to submit. Oh, I didn't realize that you were missing a signature on a piece of paper or there was something else that I needed to do. And so we were able to push additional assistance out to people just by us following up and answering some simple questions or making helping them understand there was additional assistance available. So there are little things that we're trying to do, lessons from other disasters that we're implementing, ways that we're changing our program to expand the way that we are trying to reach survivors where they are. Thank you, Dan. Uh, you yeah, so, me? sure, thanks. Um, in terms of the, the National Flood Insurance Program, there's um, kind of two answers to that. Uh, the first one is what I am able to do in, in my role as the Regional Flood Insurance Liaison, and, and that means that I'm doing uh, more education, outreach, and training uh, in communities that may have been historically underserved uh, by the National Flood Insurance Program. So, so there's that. Um, and then there's also what the National Flood Insurance Program itself is able to do. Um, it's important to remember that the National Flood Insurance Program is uh, authorized by statute, so we have to do what the law says we, we can do. Uh, and in 2012, Congress passed a law that said FEMA and National Flood Insurance Program, you must charge people a flood insurance premium based off of their risk, and you must eliminate subsidies that are built into the program. Uh, so that does mean that individual property owners are bearing uh, more and more of the cost of, of flood insurance as we eliminate the subsidies per Congress's direction. Uh, that said, uh, we did transition to a new pricing methodology about a, a year and a half, two years ago, which does provide meaningful benefits to people who have historically been underserved. One of the important things that we've done is we are now using replacement cost value in setting, uh, a, a, as a factor in setting flood insurance premiums. What that does is it does uh, reduce the flood insurance premium uh, for lower value structures, and it does increase the premium for higher value structures. Uh, the reason for this is, is long and, and detailed and very in the weeds with the, the underwriting. If you want to talk more about it, I'd be happy to answer questions, but at a high level, that's what we're able to do. The last thing um, I would mention is, like I said, we are limited by statute and by Congress's instruction. Uh, FEMA did propose to Congress in May 2022 and again in May of 2023. Uh, we did propose some legislative reform to Congress that would allow us to look at things like income or other um, factors of, of vulnerability when it comes to setting individual flood insurance premiums. Uh, if you all think that that's a good idea, uh, you can go ahead and go to your favorite search engine, look for uh, NFIP legislative proposals, and if you like them, we'd welcome your support, but I can't give you any more uh, specific call to action than that, so. Thank you, James. Um, while we are, there's a specific uh, question from one of our audience members that maybe uh, you would be um, best to answer. Um, what happens with rental property? If renters are displaced because of flood damage to their rented unit, is there any insurance to assist them in finding a new place to live? Are landlords uh, eligible for flood insurance? That is a really good question. And it is kind of complicated. It's going to vary from, um, from landlord to landlord and from state to state. Um, so, and the reason I say that is this, uh, individual renters can get uh, flood insurance for their personal property within their unit. But again, by law, uh, we cannot offer uh, money to pay for them to live somewhere else while they have a, a flood damaged property, right? Um, that's when you would register for disaster assistance. That's one of those things that disaster assistance can cover that flood insurance can't. That said, this is something that's in that legislative proposal we asked Congress to do. Uh, landlords can definitely have flood insurance for the structure. Um, and why I said it's complicated and it might vary is there may be a requirement under state law for the landlord to pay for lodging for people who are displaced from their rental properties, but that's gonna vary from state to state. It might also be in, in the lease. So make sure you're checking out both of those things. Uh, contacting your state um, regulator, whoever that might be in the state with issues about landlords and renters. Um, I know this is something that comes up a lot in Michigan and there's been some legislative change in Michigan because of, of issues with landlords and flooding. Um, but finally, um, the, the last thing I'd like to point out just because it's nuanced is contract for deed. Um, if someone has contract for deed, they can also have flood insurance, but the person who owns the building 
and the person who is renting to own both need to be on the flood insurance policy. So that's the nuance of contract for a deed. And I just want to piggyback on what James said, because there he did mention it. Uh, if there is a declared disaster, renters are eligible for disaster assistance from FEMA. So we would encourage that renter, uh, if they didn't have flood insurance, or even if they did have flood insurance for their personal property, to go ahead and register with FEMA. We'll ask them about their flood insurance uh, or whatever other insurance they have. Uh, but renters are eligible for disaster assistance from FEMA. And this is an area where disaster assistance and insurance and SBA loans work together to fill the gaps that we have in each other's programs. So FEMA disaster assistance can provide temporary housing or for a renter uh, that has to move out because from a flood damaged rental unit, we can help them find a new place to live and money for uh, an, an, a period of time uh, while they transition into that new place to live. So we won't provide, and again, we can provide disaster assistance for personal property not covered by insurance. Um, that renter, we won't provide disaster assistance to repair the flood damage rental unit because they didn't own it. Uh, but again, transportation, personal property, temporary lodging, like a hotel that may they may be eligible for, uh, and a number of other things under our disaster assistance programs, renters are absolutely potentially eligible for. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Mike, um, kind of talking a little bit about COVADs, I think you alluded a uh, few things that uh, local community organizations can do uh, to help with in all four phases. Could you say a little bit about, um, from your perspective, how can COADs uh, play a role in equitable um, equitable recovery, or like just taking that equity approach to disaster um, recovery. How can uh, what are what are some of the best roles that uh, coads can play? Well, um, Dan mentioned this earlier, as far as you know, getting local input on uh, where the damage is and what type of community it is. Um, <clears throat> When we, when FEMA goes to do uh, the damage assessments before uh, declaration is declared, we generally go with uh, someone from the state and someone from the uh, local community to uh, go out and view the damaged uh, properties and see, uh, you know, what what's going on with with them. Um, who, uh, well, where, where the damage is, what type of structures they are, um, and also uh, a little bit about the, the people that live there. Um, are they uh, low to moderate income folks, or is it a, uh, maybe a, a higher uh, value? And generally, uh, folks that have a, a more expensive home, they, uh, will are more likely to have insurance to where you know uh we the fema really doesn't worry about them as much as those people that uh low to modern income folks without insurance to their structures thank you mike uh, i see some few very um um basic questions about go ads um how do you know if your community has a co-ed? Who starts a co-ed for a community? Or is there a process for obtaining co-ed status? Are there funds for funding co-ed? So uh, just like uh, maybe if you could respond yeah. to some of those sure. uh, basic questions. Thank you. Um, what I would do is I would start with contacting my uh, local emergency manager to ask if there is a co-ed. Um, and if there's not, ask. Uh, them if they would uh, uh, assist you in putting one together. Uh, also, I would contact the uh, state. Uh, um, they, there is usually a state vow in every state. Uh, I would contact them because um, being uh, working in state emergency management, one of the things that I had to do was uh, go out and uh, try to start up co-eds in uh, counties and communities across the state. 
and if someone would call me and say, we want to start a co-ed, uh, you know, your day was made right there. So uh, you uh, can help them uh, show them what a co-ed is all about, how it can be formed. Um, and if one is already there, uh, contact those folks, see when they meet, show up at the meeting, uh, introduce yourself and say, you know, what, you know, if there's something that you can bring to the table, if you're a, um, a faith-based organization that you want to get involved with co-ed because you want to help during a disaster, uh, that would be the, uh, the ideal thing to do. Um, as far as funding, there, there's no funding for, uh, co-eds. It's all, um, volunteer and it would be funds that you would raise to use during a disaster. Uh, so um, there's really no funds to start a co-ed. Uh, it's, it's all volunteer and it is uh, uh, something done uh, at a community pride um, and, uh, you know, to, to get involved, that, to help your fellow community members. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, especially that funding question. Uh, there's a question about uh, resiliency hubs, and I don't know if these are similar to co-ads or something completely different. I'll just read the question. Uh, would it make sense to create a resiliency hubs in communities that are most likely to be adversely impacted by disasters? These hubs could conduct outreach efforts to communities that may not otherwise be well familiar with FEMA offerings. Anybody have any thoughts on that responses? Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here and I'm gonna I wanna one, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit to what Mike was saying, um, and I'm gonna transition into answering that question. So on the on the subject of co-eds, I'm gonna start by saying um, everyone should have a co-ed because we, we talk about, you know, we're here from FEMA and we're talking about and people have in their head these really big disasters that happen, but disasters happen in communities every day. Uh, and these disasters are the, the kinds of things where FEMA is not going to get involved. Individual house fires or apartment building fires that need community support, that need organizations to show up with blankets and a hot meal and a gift card to a, a box store to replace personal items. These are things where co-ads can be helpful, where co-ads, which fundamentally are organizations getting together and talk about when these things happen, how are we going to not duplicate our activities with each other? So um, that's, I mean, and, and, you know, not to step on Mike's toes, but so, you know, even if it's just getting together and say, what do you do? Oh, okay. I do the same thing. So let's talk to each other. So we're not duplicating efforts here, which is a big thing in disasters where you can have a lot of times have organizations and government agencies um, coming in and trying to do the same thing. And this is something that we're working with our federal partners on. To, to the question about resiliency hubs and um, legislation was passed at the end of last year creating community disaster resiliency zones. And this is an effort to target FEMA's energies on the highest SVI areas across the country. So Coming back to your first question about uh, an equity approach to recovery, um, this pushes us, excuse me, in that direction. So without knowing exactly what the, the author of the question had in mind, um, there's a few things where you could take that question and take that initiative. So I would always say, if there is a desire to do more, to educate more, to get people more prepared, 100% yes. Um, I would just say, if you're going to do that, talk to the other people that are already doing that. Mike mentioned that it's your local emergency manager. So educating people about what's going on in the community, about how to get involved is a, always a good thing. And I will always say that's something that people can do more of. One thing I wanna remind people is that FEMA is not at the other end of 911. And so we are not going to be involved in most things that happen in your community. It's going to be those local first responders that, you're, that are going to show up. And so talk to your local emergency manager. Talk to your 
local fire, police, and emergency services about what they're going to be doing and how you can support their efforts. We have community emergency response teams, CERT teams, that it's training that FEMA can, pro, can help facilitate so that you as individuals and organizations can support those local organizations. But when there is a big disaster, you can be involved and support that larger response and recovery effort. So um, 100% yes, get in touch with us after today's presentation. We'd love to talk to you more about things that we're already doing, uh, but it sounds like something we're, it sounds like something we're already doing, but we're always happy to take new ideas and, and figure out how we can incorporate those new ideas uh, to improve on what we're, what we're doing. And it may not be happening in your community and you can lead the way. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'm going to go back to uh, flood insurance premium. I think there was a question and uh, it relates to um, uh, that equity perspective and uh, serving um, the most vulnerable. Uh, what is the range of flood insurance premiums? I'm trying to understand how doable that is for different income groups. So I, I think the, what the audience member is trying to ask is just the cost of flood insurance premiums and whether it is affordable or not. Sure. Um, so affordability is uh, obviously very subjective, right? So what one person thinks is affordable might not be affordable for someone else. Um, I can tell you that the minimum premium for flood insurance is about $300. And this is for a single family home. Other types of buildings are going to be different. But for a single family home, the minimum premium is $300 a year, more or less. And the maximum premium is around $12,000 a year. In this part of the world, Missouri, Illinois, um, basically everything in the, yeah, in this part of the world, the average premium is going to run anywhere between $700 and $1,200 a year. Um, I know that that is a significant financial burden, particularly for a, a lot of the families that were impacted by last year's flooding. Um, I kind of indicated that our options with at the federal level are, are limited by statute. So while we wait for statute to play out and we're doing the things we can under our own, under our own authority with things like replacement cost value, there are definitely things that can be done at the state and local level. Um, Wisconsin, for example, has introduced an income tax credit for flood insurance premiums. Um, so maybe that's something that uh, other states could also consider doing. Um, we also have other examples, mainly in the hurricane states, where nonprofit organizations through their community uh, or their co-ads that Mike was talking about um, did help uh, reimburse people for their flood insurance premiums if they met whatever the threshold was for that co-ed project. So those are things that can be done at the state and local level. Um, we can also uh, make sure that we're participating in our local hazard mitigation plans. Um, the, the whole community um, process of emergency management is incredibly important. And oftentimes, um, people who are most vulnerable to flooding are not involved in local hazard, mitiga local hazard mitigation planning efforts. Um, it would be really great if they could contact their local emergency manager, be involved with that, let them know uh, what the issues are in their neighborhood so that the local community can pre-identify mitigation projects. Uh, and there are ways through uh, flood insurance that that we can re that those mitigation projects would reduce your premium, whether it be a, a levy being sort of uh, be, whether it be a levy being built. It could be something like um, installing proper flood openings. It could be perhaps elevating your home. Um, it could be perhaps elevating machinery and equipment. Those would all reduce your flood insurance premium, but those require solutions at the state and local level, um, not necessarily at the federal level. Thank you. I think what I'm hearing like a theme uh, over and over is that there is a lot of uh, a role to be played for local community organizations and many other organizations at a, at a more local level. So I guess one of the questions from the audience members is, are there any best practices or case studies written about real life co-ads, member roles, challenges and successes so that like folks can replicate and learn from what other people have done? Um, yeah, the, there is actually uh, uh, state of Missouri has a, a co-ed manual that they put together. It was one of the first in the country uh, a few years back, uh, and I believe it's been updated since then. But it goes uh, step by step in how to uh, how to form a co-ed, uh, what a co-ed uh, can accomplish, uh, things like that. Um, I, I think you could, I think it's online and it may be on the Missouri State Emergency Management website 
you can find it there. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I, it's uh, several other states have used it as a uh, template. And uh, uh, so it, that is one resource you can have. There's uh, other resources online uh, about coeds. Also, I want to mention um, there are resources uh, that FEMA has as far as classes. Uh, there's individual uh, uh, study classes that uh, you can get on uh, and learn all kinds of things uh, regarding uh, emergency management uh, and uh, how to respond to disasters. Uh, one one important thing I would suggest is start off with uh, the uh, 100 class where you learn the language of emergency management. Um, you know, FEMA is uh, chock full of uh, acronyms. And in fact, they have a book of acronyms that has an acronym for it. It's called the FAT book. The FEMA... Um, acronyms and terms and uh, technology or something. I don't know. Anyway, uh, it lists everything in there, every acronym that they have uh, to date. I'm sure uh, this afternoon they've come up with others. But anyway, what, uh, what is key is to learn the language of emergency management. And uh, that will uh, that will really uh, help you as you uh, as you go forward. Thank you, thank you. Uh, well, we are we are at time. Thank you so much, James, Dan, Mike. Uh, this was a wonderful conversation. I hope we can continue the conversation. We should con continue the conversation. Um, and now I'm going to pass it on to Whitney. Thank you again to our speakers for providing insightful information and engaging our audience. And attendees, thank you for spending your valuable time with us this afternoon. Um, before we close out this session, we do have just a few small requests. Please complete the survey that will be sent to you immediately after the event so we can improve and continue to bring, bring you timely and relevant topics. Today's session will be also available on YouTube and on our Con Connecting Communities website in about two weeks. Um, we encourage you to visit Fed Communities at fedcommunities.org to access additional articles, resources, and data about community development across the Federal Reserve. And don't forget to subscribe to the Fed Communities newsletter by clicking the About Us tab and then clicking subscribe. This session, including the slides, will be available and featured in our next newsletter and on our website. We, we invite you to follow us on social media. We are on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Fed Communities. Finally, mark your calendars for our next Connecting Communities event happening July 13th at 3 p.m. More details and registration information will be available soon, so definitely keep an eye out for that. Um, thanks again for joining Connecting Communities with Real People for Real Conversations about real topics and research. Have a fabulous afternoon. Mm -hmm.